Greetings from CNS and welcome to this special episode of CNS Dialogues which is a special CNS series pr presenting thoughtful and insightful uh, interviews with people and leaders to accelerate progress towards the sustainable development goals and one of those goals is to end AIDS by 2030 and we have just 133 months left to do so. Are we on track? Let us hear from our special guest today. Today we have with us Ms. Rose. Uh, how do I pronounce your surname mm -hmm. or do I not pronounce it? Ektasadi. Ektasadi, who is Executive Director, Southern African HIV and AIDS Information Dissemination Service, which is more commonly known as SafeEds. And we also have with us Crispin Chomba, who is SafeEds Country Director for Zambia. We are on site from Africa's biggest conference on AIDS, that is ICASA 2019, the 20th International Conference on AIDS and Sexually Transmitted Infections in Africa, which is being held in Kigali, Rwanda. Welcome, uh, Rose and Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, Rose, the number of PLHIV on ART in Sub Saharan Africa has doubled over the last five years. Uh, but there has been no increase in domestic and international funding. Uh, so uh, how did this happen? Because of better program management? Could you just explain a little bit about that? Thank you very much, uh, Shuba, Shoba, Shoba, Ms. Shukia. Uh, we're very honored and privileged to join CNS, and particularly to speak on such a topical issue uh, because even before 2030, we are looking at the fast track targets for 2020, yes. which is round the corner. Okay. Indeed, you are right, there has been a lot of success in enrollment, retention, um, and care and support around people living with HIV, accessing antiretroviral therapy, but also uh, the continuum of care. Yes, domestic funding to a degree in many of our states did not increase. In some pockets, international and bilateral funding did increase or remain sustained. But I would probably attribute the success to our communities, the power of our communities. And as you are probably mo most familiar, where communities are engaged, they are equipped with the knowledge, the skills, the confidence. They identify their own challenges to health impediments. They identify their own solutions which are lasting. And they collaborate and cooperate together as one force to enable support systems and mechanisms that preserve the advancement of their community members. And so there's been a lot of work that civil society partners have done, like SAFAIDS and many of our other partners, working with communities. And by communities, of course, communities, everybody. You're, a, you're in a community, yes, I'm in a community. So by communities, um, I will give specific examples, for example, that's, that SAFAIDS has been involved in in the SADC region, um, includes collaborating with groups of women, groups of men, they are often traditional pockets or social pockets, groups of young people in school and out of school because communities are often built around uh, schools with traditional leaders and religious leaders as you're very familiar, uh, these spheres of leadership are extremely inf influential in either motivating and mobilizing their population of reach to healthy behavior practices, or they could perpetuate harmful practices. So the work we've done with communities has actually enabled transformation and, um, and an empowerment, and then they've taken it on. And the UNAIDS um, World AIDS Day report that has recently come out, um, Communities Make a Difference, as you might be familiar, is a very clear evidence to us that our communities are indeed the light, the fire, and the force for sustained response. But I want to add, that does not take away the responsibility of our duty bearers, 
our political leaders, our decision makers, to honor the commitments that they have made through various international and regional instruments. Uh, okay. uh, thank you. You've been working <laughs> with uh, key populations. Now, there were, I think, around 1.1 million new HIV infections in uh, Africa itself, in sub-Saharan Africa, in 2018. And unless we check these new infections, how are we going to end AIDS by 2030? Not just by treatment alone, but also preventing new infections from taking place. Where are these new infections coming from, Rose? Are they mainly more from certain key pockets or key populations? And uh, what is... Uh, what is hindering us from controlling these? Thank you very much. And uh, that's definitely the nail on the head that you've hit. So um, achieving 90 by 90 by 90 is probably easier to do. But the prevention agenda, somewhere along the line, fell off the table. And we have suddenly I guess as a global movement, realize we should have been continually speaking prevention with the same vigor and, and fervency that we did for the 90 by 90 by 90. I think my basic response to you, why? Because we have continued to stigmatize and discriminate. We have continued to separate certain humans from other humans and um, and that is what has placed certain populations, which are referred to as key populations, um, at greater risk, most vulnerable, for various reasons. Uh, you may, you're aware that in many of the, of the countries uh, in the SADC region, same-sex relations, um, which really is a human being loving a human being in reality, is actually criminalized. What does that do when a person is criminalized, um, is labeled as unacceptable? They continue to live, but they do so underground. They do so in fear. The courage, the confidence, the space for them to access services becomes minimal. The ostracization from various pockets, whether it's their own community, immediate community, whether it's the religious community, whether it's the service providers or the political leadership and law enforcement create very restrictive environments for them to access their rights, their fundamental rights as human beings. So the transgender population, sex workers, men who have sex with men, Basically, any human being whose society has decided to wrongfully label as unacceptable um, is then restricted from accessing services due to them. That places them at greater risk. If you do not have access to HIV prevention services, are you going to stop having sex? Probably not. It's your right to have sex. If you don't have access to the information, then how will you even know how to prevent and protect yourself, let alone your partner? There is also another population that has been at risk, um, at greater risk recently, and that is adolescent girls and young women. And, and this is within the ages specifically um, in, in certain pockets, uh, in the localized epidemics, between 15 and 19 years, and even more high between 15 and 17 years. And the fundamental reason for that is really based in gender inequality practices. The exposure of adolescent girls and young women to sexual gender-based violence, for example, um, their, their coercion into early sexual debut without information, without capacity, without confidence, without the knowledge um, in terms of making the right choices. But we have seen, and there is ample evidence, that where comprehensive sexuality education has been introduced and has been systematically allowed to roll out within school and out of school settings, it has actually been a very strongly protective factor. It not only protects 
adolescent girls and young women from exposure to HIV. But of course, if those have been in, uh, infected, um, it motivates accessing treatment and care and quality of life improves. But they also stay in school. They avoid early and unintended pregnancy. They avoid unsafe abortion. Their lives are saved. So the issue of stigma and discrimination this many decades into the HIV epidemic for certain populations of human beings requires serious, urgent, um, and intense attention and address. For as long as we do not address all human beings in the epidemic and we leave some behind, our achievements not only will reverse very quickly, but we will not meet the targets that we, we intend to achieve. Yeah, very, very rightly said. Uh, Crispin, what has been uh, Zambia's response uh, to the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic in the context of particularly children, uh, adolescents and young people also to an extent? Uh, who have been directly or even indirectly affected by the epidemic. Uh, it's really disheartening to see that still we are having new inf newly infected kids and children. No, no child uh, means they are suffering for no fault of their own. So what has been Zambia's response and uh, how is CEFIRS helping to deal with this crisis? There? Thank you, Shaba, for having us. Uh, Talking about Zambia, uh, I'll obviously tackle it from two angles. I'll talk about Zambia, but I would also want to infer it to the region uh, because the experiences that are facing Zambia are what is common also to other countries in the region, particularly the Sadiq uh, region. So yes, as, as, as you have pointed out, it's actually disheartening to see that a number of children, um, the rate of infection among the children is actually increasing. So when you look at the adult population, for instance, HIV prevalence is either stabilizing or going down. But when you look at the children, the HIV prevalence, the new cases of HIV are actually on the increase in certain uh, subgroupings of the children, particularly uh, those children that are age 15 and 19. And we also know that other children are, uh, you know, are born with HIV through mother-to-child transmission. Uh, so that's the reality. And of course, when you look at the African population, the Zambian population, so Zambia is, uh, is regarded as having a young face as well as a female face, meaning the majority of the population are actually young. And of course, the majority of those are either going to be girls and young women. Uh, so for instance, if you want to look at Zambia, we have about uh, 3.9 million uh, children, that is those that are aged 19 and below. And uh, of course, of those that are aged between, between that age, you find that teenage pregnancies, for instance, is about 16,000 every year. And this is typical of a number of African states, such as uh, Zimbabwe as well, where children uh, and young people are falling pregnant, particularly the, the, the girls falling pregnant. 16,000, that's a huge number of them. And we know that uh, teenage pregnancy is related to a number of issues, including HIV, including, uh, including SGBV, uh, which is sexual gender-based violence, and other social ills. It has also an influence on their education, because as soon as someone gets pregnant, then they get ma married. Uh, if they, they don't get sick, uh, of course, they get out of school. And of course, it perpetuates the cycle, the vicious cycle of the inequality and uh, you know, the disproportionate nature of how HIV affects them. So it puts them more at risk. So that's the reality, unfortunately, that we are living with. We also know that in Africa, for instance, in 30 years to come, a number of those people that we are calling children today are actually going to be occupying their space. About 1.3 billion uh, growth in Africa is going to happen in the next 30 years of these that are children now. So we then need to look at what kind of investment, what kind of response are we attaching to children. Unfortunately, when you now look at uh, a number of strategic plans, for instance, a number of our budgets, 
you find that there's very limited budgets that go to address the adolescent needs of these children. There's either no budget for sexual productive or services, or even where there's a budget line allocated to that, there's mismanagement of the same budget, such that even when you want to prevent teenage pregnancies, you don't find services in some of the areas. You don't find uh, youth-friendly services. You don't find high trained uh, personnel to handle the adolescents and the children needs uh, as it were. So this is a huge concern. So unless we really put investment where it should be, and this is in the children, because that's uh, like one artist said, if we, don't, uh, if we don't build the children, we don't build the future. There is no future for, for instance, because we know whether we like it or not, the adult population at some point is going to phase out. And then the children go to occupy this space. But what kind of children do we want? Are these the children that are infected with <coughs> HIV? Are these the children that are, uh, that, that are not empowered to complete their education? Because we also know that the dependent ratio um, in Africa, as well as Zambia, is like in every 100 working uh, individuals, 97 depend on those. And this is because when you look at the bottom, these are the children that are are supposed to be educated and they occupy the larger space, they continue to depend on those few that are in the upper uppermost. Mm -hmm. So if HIV is not addressed at the lowest level, which is at the point of the children, certainly the future that we are going to have is not going to be an equitable future, is not going to be a, a gender uh, balanced future, is not going to be an empowered uh, future as it is. So it's we have a window of hope, for instance. Yes, we know that among the children, the HIV prevalence, although it's increasing compared to the adult population, is still um, lower than the adult population. So this is a window of hope that we need to invest more on addressing the needs of the children, addressing um, HIV or preventing HIV among the children before they reach this population, uh, which is an adult population. So again, as a uh uh, what I understand is that uh, there should be equal uh, emphasis on prevention, not just treating. Up, uh, yes, treatment is important and uh, reaching ART to as many people as possible is very important, but also to prevent new infections from taking place. And uh, another thing which comes to my mind is the TB co-infection because still TB is taking the life of many people living with HIV. They are living longer lives because of HIV and dying of tuberculosis. I think in 2018 about 250,000 people with HIV died of tuberculosis. Uh, can I have your thoughts on that? That uh, why are we failing to prevent uh, TB deaths and rather prevent TB in people with HIV? Thank you. So Chris and I will share the response yes, sure. on this one. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the learnings um, in, the, in the response that we've had over the past um, perhaps five to ten years is that the response need, for, the, for the HIV response to be not only successful but for the gains to be made, um, to be sustained, the gains made to be sustained, uh, is that HIV cannot be addressed in a silo. Mm. And for, for a long time, and even at this, even now in many settings, HIV is addressed almost in a silo. The integration um, of responses at primary health level, at community level, in terms of advocacy and mobilization, um, in terms of information dissemination, but, but, but also at the service delivery level um, requires effective integration of HIV, TB, and sexual reproductive health, other sexual reproductive, like sexual gender-based violence, um, and um, so on and so forth, depending on the demographic age group of, of the client or the person. And um, where HIV and TB responses have been integrated, we have really seen success. Um, WHA, most of our countries in the region are following WHO guidelines. We, we should commend our governments um, for that. However, TB, TB prevention 
is always not easy in, 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 I think, the basic, you know, crowded areas, access to information and, and so forth. But also the treatment. Mm. Um, there are basic uh, needs when one is on TB treatment and nutrition is one of them. Uh, definitely as much as it is the same for ARVs. Um, and if there are no provisions to enable households to have access to good nutrition, we know it's a right, but we also know the economic and livelihoods weaknesses that many of our populations um, undergo in the communities that we're in, more so now uh, where climate change, floods and, and various natural disasters have hit many of the, 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 in the countries where we are living in from either from the extreme of floods to the extreme of droughts access to substantial I would like to interrupt that and also conflicts also the conflicts that is also wars and internal uh, political crisis I think that is also adding to it yes you are absolutely right um, there has been there has been an, perhaps interesting times in the SADC region mm. and um, and sometimes not very obvious mm. um, well, in Africa anyway, sometimes not very obvious in terms of civil strife or war, mm -hmm. sometimes just economic demise mm -hmm. that is probably a lot more subtle um, in the public face, but at an individual level has intrinsically reduced the capacity of individuals and households, um, their capacity to make correct and suitable health cheek health-seeking choices for themselves because the basic access to shelter, access to water and sanitation and hygiene, access to food is not there. So of course the interest to go and get a test and, 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 and the defaulting also um, goes, goes up. Uh, we are involved uh, as SAFAIDS, um, particularly in a program that has been funded by Global Fund. Mm -hmm. It's called the TIMS program. Mm -hmm. It is in uh, 10 countries in the SADC region of Africa. Uh, TB in the mining sector, that's okay. TIMS. TIMS, that's that. Yes, okay. Okay. TB in the mining sector. Mm -hmm. And it is addressing, um, mobilizing mm -hmm. miners, mm -hmm. ex-miners, mm -hmm. um, artisanal and small-scale miners, mm -hmm. their families and their communities to, to access diagnostic services and thereafter be um, initiated on treatment and retained in care, and integrating that with HIV, um, HIV response uh, services as well. Okay. Would you like to add something? So, so certainly, uh, we know that there is a, there is a close connection between HIV and TB. Um, of course, there are higher chances of someone who is HIV positive to have uh, to have TB. Mm -hmm. But we're also uh, comforted by the fact that TB is preventable, yes. TB is treatable yes. uh, as long as uh, one goes for treatment, seeks uh, medical care uh, at an opportune time, it can be prevented. And of course we also know that even people that do not have HIV, they can also have TB as long as they are exposed to the conditions that predisposes them. Uh, uh, to, to TB. So for, uh, for surface, we do believe that uh, we need to raise a lot of awareness, uh, especially on those populations that are likely to be exposed to TB. So this project uh, that we are implementing uh, called TB in the Mines mm -hmm. is actually aimed at reducing uh, TB cases mm -hmm. in, the mining, in the mining areas, in the mining communities. Mm -hmm. And it goes for a lot of education, a lot of linkages, of course, from uh, from the information point of view to the service delivery points, and also finding missing cases uh, of TB, uh, so that we reduce the, the TB among the minors, but also in the communities that they live and among the children as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, are you dealing with latent TB infection also, or is there some program in Zambia where South Africa they are putting a lot many people on? Uh, a TB preventive therapy as in the latest according to the latest figures so preventing latent TB latent TB developing into active TB mm -hmm. is there any program there not yet 
Not so much. Not so we, much. We okay. have partners mm -hmm. who are very active mm -hmm. um, in the TB response, mm -hmm. and often when we identify through our work, because mm -hmm. our primary work is sexual reproductive okay. health rights, mm -hmm. gender equality mm -hmm. and gender justice, mm -hmm. and of course HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are very alert, and when we identify in our communities mm -hmm. that uh, the risk and exposure is potentially very high because of conditions. And we also identify that perhaps in this community, the, the, either the geographic or another form of distance and barrier has been created between the community and the nearest healthcare mm -hmm. provider. We then collaborate quickly and we refer to our partners who are working within the TB response at national level, usually civil society, and say, look, we, we think there might be an issue here. Could you come in? And so we do the linking and layering. We would love to, but of course, if we did everything, we'd be jack of all trades and master of none. But we are alert. We are alert, and it is our role to be, because we also look at our, our, our target audiences and beneficiaries as holistic human beings. Um, and if we identify even other areas of need, livelihoods, economic empowerment, access to education, we have a pool of partners who we refer to so that they can enhance this human being as an entity, not just someone who needs to go for an HIV test or sexual reproductive health Thanks. services. So um, what does the future of HIV AIDS look like and any out-of-the-box approaches or methods you can suggest which we should really um, take too seriously if we really want to end the epidemic by 2030? I want uh, both of you to mm. share your views on this. Okay. Anything which is out-of-the-box, which we are not doing now but we need to do urgently. Interesting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so certainly uh, it's high time that we begin to think outside the box. You did mention that uh, HIV funding has ever been dependent on the donors uh, for especially the African response. So we need the African solutions to the HIV epidemic if we're going to sustain it because you, you know that uh, we receive funds from different governments or so, you know, donors receive funds from different governments or in any day can change and say they have stopped funding the HIV, they are focusing on another area. What do we do if we know that Africa is comprising of 70% of the total population living with HIV in the world? Mm -hmm. So we need African-driven solutions. Mm -hmm. We need domestic funding, meaningful investment in, in HIV. But uh, our passion as surface is always to look at where would we yield the impact? Focus on the children and invest adequately in the HIV response uh, for children as well as uh, the young people. At the same time, we know that resources are not going to be uh, to be adequate all the time. We need to utilize the available resources uh, prudently, uh, but in a more accountable manner possible to the communities that we save. If we are going to change the, the spectrum of our HIV logs. Uh, we need to say this is our challenge, we have the solutions and we have the means to really deal with, uh, with this challenge unless we really begin to, to bear that, to own that the response is ours and not dependent on any other person, we are not going to sustain the, the, the response. So that was perfect. Yes. You really want me to add. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's necessarily out of the box, but one of the things that we're not always good at is learning. Yeah, I think that's very <clears throat> And um, if you look at the history of the epidemic and the different types of approaches and methodologies that have come through, so we moved from voluntary male circumcision and then all the resources got poured into that. And then we went on to working on a vaccine um, at microbicides. Mm -hmm. A lot went into that, but mm -hmm. do we have a microbicide? Do you access microbicides? No. Do I access microbicides? No. How many years went into that? I think the delineation of politics from development money hard as it is, is very, very important. Because for as long as there's a very close link between political agenda and the money that is invested into the HIV response, um, and I mean from a global level, you know, as cooperative aid to countries, then 
we don't always necessarily respond to the need through learning alone. Um, and the agenda can get skewed. And we don't give ample time. If we have learned, for example, that male engagement will reduce gender inequality and that will further reduce vulnerability and risk to HIV, then we need to allow that learning to evolve and get stronger. So the shifts and all the sexy words that come around, now we are speaking universal health access. That's the yes, buzzword. Yes, yes. Very good, it's correct, mm -hmm. it's right. Mm -hmm. But are we going to forget? Years ago we spoke about the three ones. Mm -hmm. You remember? Yes, yes. The three ones still matter now, mm -hmm. more than ever. Can you please repeat that again? Uh, Less people have forgotten. Please repeat. One coordinated, one, one plan. One M&E plan. One M &E plan one coordinated mechanism, yeah. and I've forgotten the third one. I think it was one plan. And then there's one, one response, yeah. one response with funding and so on. But I, I have actually forgotten, but th there we go. There we go, that was the mantra for that point. But the concerted efforts remain <clears throat> very clear. We keep learning it over and over again that when we don't unite and come together with our different competencies, civil society, members of parliament, local leadership, service providers, states, then the epidemic response becomes fragmented. So the learning and, the, the, and then the delineation with politics, which is very difficult, it is very linked to what Crispin has just mentioned. When domestic funding is released, Domestic funding speaks to the localized epidemic and it's not really political. It actually speaks directly to what the need is. And that is the advantage of domestic funding. Um, of course, bilateral funding, cooperative funding is very valuable, but there is a limit to which countries and states can dictate how they would like to use these resources for their localized epidemic. Um, I'm not sure again if this is out of the box per se, but it's, it, it's really important and I referred to it earlier, is that HIV can no longer, not just HIV, but you know, other health issues can no longer be addressed on its own as a health issue. It just doesn't work because the client is a human being with other needs, other lively life needs. And um, the integration the consistent integration within other sectors and other sectors integrating into the HIV response um, has been shown to be, to be vital as well. But I believe we have so many lessons that I've learned where we've seen successes. I mean, look at Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Observe Rwanda, you know, on the African continent. The lessons are very clear. The menu, the recipe, sorry, the recipe is very clear. Um, we need to invest in what works mm -hmm. and continue to do so consistently so that we allow, we allow, we allow one, its institutionalization and for the results to be sustained. Um, of course, well, I'm not saying we shouldn't be innovative, but innovative within the learning mm -hmm. and not, not, not um, every few years mm -hmm shifting directions and, um, and losing attention. We've had so much investment in, in, in PMTCT or EMTCT in mm -hmm. some countries. And then what? What will happen in a few years' time if we move away and say we've achieved? We have to sustain it. Yes. We saw what happened in Uganda. Remember, it was Uganda years ago that, that was really our, our star, shining star mm -hmm. in the response. Mm -hmm and things shifted and changed and, and moved in another direction um, because I guess there was some relaxation um, that took place there. So the learning is, 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 is really critical and we hope that in, in, this, in this conference particularly we were hoping to hear more around, similar to what he said, um, very diligently looking at the HIV epidemic and its other facets through a health financing lens. You know, it's, it really, for as long as our governments are not looking at it through a health financing lens, 
um, through a value for money lens. You save one life or you improve the quality of one life with X amount. This is the impact it will have on the GDP and the macroeconomy. Those formulas um, need to be pushed and driven. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And rightly said that it's uh, not only funding, but uh, judicious and proper use of funds and putting them in the place where they are needed most. I think that is, that is very important. That is the point both of you have made very rightly. Would you like to add anything else? Uh, anything else which comes to your mind or your message for ICASA 2019 since we are here only? So, yeah, maybe just to reiterate, uh, the message for ICASA, we have had a lot of ICASAs. Uh, many, many of many of them, uh, but we need to really look at what will make a difference going forward, because we know that the future obviously is going to be comprised of young people and the children, and of course the funding the funding is not probably going to improve. Probably it is going to be going lower and lower and lower. How best are we going to uh, to end HIV, or how, how best are we going to reach? our target of ending AIDS by 2030. So we really need to, to look at things that have worked, embrace those that have worked. Uh, we can't throw everything that we have worked for. Uh, I think in the past we embraced primary health care. Now the new buzzword is universal health coverage. Uh, after the WHO building blocks as well. So what is it that we want to focus on? Ultimately, it's a human being at the center of the response. And it's through that lens that we can make a difference. So it's every human being, not particularly human beings that we, we, we like or we, we dislike. It's every human being, every human life counts, and every human being should be treated as equal, even the HIV response, if we are going to get to, uh, to ending AIDS by, by 2030. It's possible. It's feasible. We've seen it from countries that have invested, like Rwanda, where we are now. We know that we can suppress the viral load. We know that we can put so many people on treatment, but it calls to embrace everyone and those that are left furthest behind. Well, that was perfect. The only thing that I would probably add is that um, when we come to conferences like this, we, I think, silently ask ourselves, are we not amongst the converted already? <laughs> And sometimes, I think yesterday we had a session, and I sat and I looked at everybody in the audience, and I said, but you know, 90% I knew in the session, about 40 people. And I was like, every one of the 90% who are in this room that I know are already working on this topic. Are we speaking to the right people? Are we coming together with the right people? Is it the converted? re-engaging the converted, which is very also important because we will motivate each other, we will inspire each other, and we will support each other um, to, to, to solve our challenges in, in the movement. But how do we get to the non-converted? What are we doing differently? And who are the non-converted? What are the populations that are not on board? It's not just the state. There are other actors, private sector. There is a, is a massive space. I mean, our economies are run by the pa parastatals and private sector, of course, in collaboration with our states. What are the spaces that have not been tapped? And what platforms do we have to engage them? Are they here? Do we invite them? Do we request them to put in their budgets to join us here and hear from us the, the evidence that is coming out in these conferences and then unpack that evidence in their own spaces, whether it's in the mining sector, in the agriculture sector, in the trade and finance sector, in the justice sector. Are the judges here, for example, uh, the judiciary, the law enforcement, because they all have an impact on the HIV epidemic, on gender equality and the, you know, everything around this one human being that we would like to get tested, put on treatment, and live longer. There is much more that person will need. They'll need employment. They'll need to go to school. They'll need shelter. 
um, and so forth. So perhaps that's something out of the box to look at more. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Very well said. And thank you, Rose and Crispin, for being with us today here. Friends, in this episode of CNS Dialogues for Sustainable Development, we were listening to Rose, Executive Director of South Southern African HIV and AIDS Information Dissemination Service. This is such a long word, and I love it's to just longer. use CEFIDS. Yes, yeah, CEFIDS. It is just CEFIDS. Yeah. But that is was just for the benefit of our listeners, right. I was saying. Okay. CEFIDS is best. And to Crispin uh, Chomba, CEFIDS Country Director for Zambia, on site from ICASA 2019 taking place in Kigali, Rwanda. Thank you very much and stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you.